a KQED HD production. The cool thing about bikes as a machine is that they're the most efficient way to get around, even more efficient than walking. So essentially, we can get more power out for less amount of food in. They're so simple, but allow us to do so much. I'm an avid bicyclist. I work with advocacy groups. I want to see more bicycles on the road. All I think about is bicycles in all kinds of forms and ways. Few places in the United States are as enthusiastic about bike riding as Davis, California. We believe that Davis is the bicycle capital of the United States. 22% of trips to work were made by bicycle in Davis, and that was far and away more than any other city in the United States. And the city is home to the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame, where modern biking meets old-fashioned ingenuity. So it's no surprise that mechanical engineers at the University of California, Davis, are trying to figure out how these simple-looking machines actually work so well. And take down any extra notes, too. If anything unusual happens during the run, we hit a bump, it looks like the data didn't get collected. I'm trying to understand how a person balances on a bicycle. It just seems like a silly little problem that why the hell are you studying how a person balances on a bike, you know? If we understand better from an engineering and mathematical perspective how that works, we may be able to change the bicycle maybe into a new form, into something different that has properties that we, we desire more, maybe more stability, for example, or, or handleability. I'm in a harness because I only want to study how we're able to balance on a bicycle by controlling the steering action. I'm not interested in how you control a bicycle by leaning, or shifting your butt or moving your knees back and forth. So we're not going to pedal um, on the bike because it's sort of a confounding factor if you want to look at only how we balance and, and keep stable. Through previous experiments, Moore figured out that steering is the single most important way in which riders balance on a bicycle. Now he's observing in more detail exactly what a cyclist does to stay on top of the bike. He measures the cyclist's reaction to a force, such as a simulated gust of wind. Somebody pushes you from the side, and then the person that gets pushed on the bike, they try to either stay on a line or just stay heading straight. So we measure how hard the person pushes, and we also measure everything that the rider does, how much torque they put on the handlebars, how fast they turn the handlebars, how fast that they're leaning. You'd think that after nearly 200 years of two-wheeled transportation, scientists would have figured this out. Not so. In fact, scientists actually understand airplanes better than bicycles, likely because the stakes are so much higher when an airplane crashes. I think the main thing that we've discovered about the bicycle is its complexity and how not just one thing explains how, why it behaves. It's a complex interaction of many many things. Things like a bike's mass and geometry interact in ways so complicated that to describe them requires 30 pages of equations. So in terms of geometry and trying to think about a bicycle being stable or easily controllable, the main things that are at play there probably how far the wheels are apart, the wheelbase, what angle that the steer axis is at relative to ground, and then also how far the contact point of the front wheel trails behind the intersection of the steer axis and the ground, what we call the caster or the trail. <laughs> Surprisingly, things like the size of its wheels don't really make a bicycle more or less stable. This is a, a high wheeler bike or a penny farthing that's from the late 1800s and early 1900s. And this is a replica. And contrary to what you may believe, uh, being up high can actually have benefits for stability. It gives you a little more time to react and steer in the direction that you need to go. That's because it takes longer for you to fall and hit the ground. 
And another interesting fact is that because of the larger diameter wheel, more mass is out on the rim of the bicycle wheel than close to the center of the wheel. And that adds more inertia and thus more gyroscopic effect, potentially giving more stability to the bicycle. Just like a toy gyroscope, bicycle wheels spinning fast are pretty stable. This is due in part to what are called gyroscopic forces. If I spin the wheel, you can do this demonstration at home, you can wiggle the wheel and you'll feel unusual torques and forces happening on your hands. So if I push forward, see how it goes back up, right? When we stick the bicycle wheel in the bicycle, it turns out that those additional forces from the gyroscopic effect are beneficial for stability. So given bicycles' complexity, how did inventors come up with its design? It really evolved from a, from a tinkering perspective. You know, let's put two wheels together and see how they work. And finally, somebody figured out that we can sort of balance on top of this bicycle. I'd like to take you on a tour of some of the antique and vintage bicycles here at the United States Bicycling Hall of Fame. This is one of the uh, earliest two-wheeled machines. It's a, from the 1820s. It's called a Drazine. It's named for its inventor, Carl von Drace, a German. It's considered by some to be a precursor to the true bicycle. So what they would do with this thing is just straddle it and push themselves along uh, with their feet. The next step was something called a velocipede or a bone shaker. They figured out to add pedals to the front wheel. Then came the high wheel bike with its huge front wheel, which made it fast and dangerous. The brakes would apply to the front of the bicycle and the bike would go forward and you'd flip over the front. In response, inventors created the so-called safety bicycle. The chain drive allowed the pedals to be moved off the wheel. Now bikes had two wheels of the same size, rolling on inflatable tires that made the ride more comfortable. Safety bikes became a sensation in the 1890s. Of course, that was before the invention of the car. It's like, you know, the automobile was still about 20 years away from being a practical invention. And so they were an incredibly popular form of real transportation, not just recreation. Today, even though there are one billion bikes in the world, the car reigns supreme in America. Only 1% of commuters in the United States ride to work on a bike. Scientists like Moore hope that safer, more stable bicycles might entice more people to use them as transportation. In fact, science is already helping some inventors create bicycles that are easier to balance on. A product designed at Dartmouth College adds gyroscopic forces to the inside of the wheel of a kid's bike. This makes it easier to learn to ride. Moore imagines a future in which bicycles could help solve even bigger problems, like traffic jams and pollution. You could think about uh, bicycles that drive themselves, that you don't even have to control at all, and could be autonomous could be a narrow track vehicle that doesn't take up a lot of space. So the kind of things that we are figuring out, I think are a nice foundation so that people can use our tools and our understanding to create better bicycles.